Welcome to another video by IB Blueprint. Today we discuss 7 steps to getting a 7 in IB Chemistry. So what makes IB Chemistry difficult? Well as an executive tutor at Australian IB Tuition, I've taught numerous students who struggle with chemistry. They were often daunted by the large amount of content and the difficulty of questions. First of all, many students lacked an understanding of the theory and thus the skills necessary for tackling exam questions. So what we'll discuss today is a seven step method to first of all understanding the theory and then being good at doing questions and tackling the exam. So what is this seven step method? First of all, choose SL versus HL in your options wisely. This will set you up from the start to do well. Two, have a broad theoretical understanding. Three, do a point by point syllabus, syllabus coverage. Four, be able to reverse engineer solutions. Five, think like a mark scheme. Six, do at least five full pass papers under time pressure. And seven, don't blame others for your failure. Step one, choose wisely. HL chemistry is significantly more difficult than SL. If you are struggling with standard level chemistry, do not choose high level unless there is no other option. All of the standard level chemistry core can actually be quite easily covered in one year. HL, however, is much more complex and, intellect and has more intellectually difficult topics. Interestingly enough though, statistically, 14% of students achieved a 7 at standard level and 26% at high level. This does not mean that high level is easier, but rather that the stronger students choose higher level. Also note that the cutoff for stand level is lower than the cutoff for a 7 at higher level. For options, we recommend modern analytical chemistry and environmental chemistry. These are the two easiest topics. Modern analytical chemistry because it can be covered in the shortest amount of time and requires the least amount of memorization. Environmental chemistry is easier because it is fairly syllabus point based. If you can cover all the syllabus points, you should do fairly well in your exam because the actual questions in environmental chemistry are fairly regurgitation based as opposed to being able to solve difficult problems. Two, a broad theoretical understanding. This means you should learn the theory well before attempting to do questions in each topic. An intelligent student with just the theory will be able to understand the questions well, or at least the solutions. They will know why they are right or wrong when they are told. However, a student with little theoretical understanding and tries to tackle questions too early when making the same mistakes repeatedly in questions and not really understanding why they are doing things wrong. A good suggestion here is to listen to your teacher in class and if not, then make sure to read through the textbook and understand broadly the important concepts. Next, we go even deeper. We do a point by point syllabus coverage. The IV can only examine that which is in the syllabus. When setting exam papers, the exam writers um, ensure that what they set is within the syllabus bounds. So by knowing the syllabus in depth, we can minimize what can surprise you in the final exam. What I recommend is to print out the syllabus, single-sided so you have plenty of space, and annotate every syllabus point, point by point by point. This ensures there will, there will be no questions that can come up that will surprise you. Take note especially of definitions, because in the syllabus points, it will tell you what you need to be able to define and explain. Sometimes the syllabus will even tell you what the definition is, so you should memorize that definition. Be able to reverse engineer solutions. Once you've gone through the syllabus, you should be at a decent level and at least have a general understanding of most of the points in the syllabus. Don't worry if you can't memorize every point at this stage. You won't need to until the day before your last exam. If you can't do a particular question, so don't worry. But at this stage, at step four, you should be able to at least understand the answer when you look at the mark scheme. So if you look at a question, you can't do it, that's fine, look at the answer. And then once you look at the answer, 
try to reverse engineer how to work out and how to get to that answer. If you can do that, this is step four. If you can't do that, revise your theory again, because you should at least be able to understand what's happening by looking at the answers. Over time, you should become less and less dependent on the masking with more and more practice. Step five, be able to think like a mask scheme. There are many who interpret the syllabus. You, your teacher, the textbook, the exam writer, and the marker. More often than not, these will not perfectly coincide. You may think that this is accessible, but the examiner might think something different. The only two opinions that matter in the end are the person who writes the exam and the person who marks your exam because these two people will be the people who determine what your final score is. So by scrutinizing masking, you start to see what IB answers should look like. You try to think like the writer and the marker. Often when you have a three mark question, there's usually three things to include. And often when you look at the mark scheme, there'll be specific ways that they like the answer to be laid out. Furthermore, you should use answers from previous mark schemes because these answers have proven to be right in the past. In particular, definitions and explanations, they may be slightly different to the textbook. Sure, an examiner may accept a textbook definition that's different from the mark scheme, but why take the risk? Six, do at least five full pass papers under time pressure. Perfect practice makes perfect, and what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. There are only so many types of questions the IB can ask. Do enough questions and you'll begin to notice patterns. You'll be able to see very similar questions repeated throughout more and more past papers. This will also reinforce your theoretical understanding. So as you do this, do the question. If you don't understand, look at the mark scheme. And then if you don't understand the mark scheme, then you need to revise the theory. In the long run, what you need to be able to do is to do full pass papers with no need of the mark scheme and no need of the textbook. Overall, the more pass papers you do, the less chance there will be of you getting surprised by a difficult question in the final. Don't blame others for your failure. A good teacher minimizes the amount of self-study you need to do, but a teacher cannot bring that to zero. Having a poor teacher simply means you need to do more self-study. Simply blaming the teacher will not get you a 7. Because you know what you need to know simply by looking at the syllabus. If your teacher is behind, if your teacher is ahead, if your teacher has missed entire concepts, you still, there's still every chance that that can come up in the final. So, so what you should do is combine the resources from textbooks, the internet, what we teach you here at IB Blueprint and past papers, and you can cover all the syllabus points. There's no excuse for not knowing the content in the end. Closing thoughts. The ultimate responsibility of education lies in the student and not the teacher. Many teachers may run behind schedule. They may miss particular concepts. I have students who told me that their teacher has not covered the entire bonding angle and shape topic. However, in the final, that may still be assessed. And in the end, nobody cares what your teacher has or has not taught you. It's your responsibility to know what you need to know, and that's easily done from the syllabus. You should learn it through various resources you have access to, and then subsequently practice it. We hope this has helped you in your IB chemistry studies and wish you all the best in the future. Thank you.